Today's topic is anarchism, and uh, our special guest today is uh, Nika Dubrovsky. Uh, welcome, Nika, and thank you so much for joining us. Nika is an artist and an author who grew up in the unofficial cultural scenes of squat and some is that of the late Soviet Union. And uh, she works on several publishing and artistic projects, including Anthropology for Kids, an open source platform experimenting with new educational format, uh, which she co-created with her uh, late husband, anthropologist and activist David Graeber. She also works on uh, Visual Assembly, which is a collective public art project, uh, and the Yes Women Group, which is an art activist feminist community, and many others. Most of her projects are dedicated to the building and maintaining of social relationships. And uh, she's also an author of, of several books and articles, which have been published in Finnish, English, Russian, Ukrainian, German, Japanese, and so on. Nika, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, now I would like to ask uh, our guests today, um, if you could kindly introduce yourself in a few words, we are all very curious uh, about your background and uh, why you are interested uh, in this topic. Nika? Yeah, I just wanted to first of all say that on the topic of anarchism, the very interesting no experts. <laughs> so the, the would be oxymoron to be an expert on anarchism. And that's why I, I came not alone. So I invited my friends who is, uh, yeah, who are very welcome to introduce themselves. So uh, why don't we do this round of introductions uh, like a snowball? So for example, uh, the first one on my screen is uh, Christina. So if you could kindly introduce yourself in a few words and then pass the ball to someone else. Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Christina. Um, I uh, study um, Eastern traditional medicines, actually. Um, and I used to work in medical research. Um, I was a political organizer for a little bit, and I was just very focused on healthcare access. Um, and I'm very interested in political philosophy because of that. Um, and with anarchism, I've always really loved like the philosophy of mutual aid and as well as just their critiques of power. Um, and I'm a big Ursula K. Le Guin fan who uh, does a lot of interesting anarchist writing. So yeah, I, I've organized with anarchists and I'm very kind of interested in the philosophy. Uh, let's see, Jamie, you wanna go next? Yeah, big Ursula Le Guin fan, that's, that's uh, right on Christina. <laughs> Um, uh, I also am not an academic in any way whatsoever, but it turns out I'm a total fucking um, uh, anarchist. And um, I, I think it came from just uh, doing it anyway. I think the idea of anarchism, as I understand it, after reading David's brilliant little paper, is it's our natural default mode as, as humanity. And um, so I'm coming here really through... A bizarre situation. I had a gun put to my head in 1981 in Palestine for taking pictures of soldiers shooting at kids and realising this is just just because I'm born in Bromley, I'll never have this. Right. This is mad. So I got into activism for 40 years and then um, the Occupy movement happened and I saw the joy of participatory democracy assemblies where smarty pants with lots of education, they'd have two minutes and quite a lot of people will go hooray. And then nervous working class woman, five children, takes fag in one hand, microphone in the other, and says, I've never done anything like this before, but I feel like I've got to say this. And the fucking angels sang. What I'm getting at is, is the, the, the leaders were the people who had no agency, who, had, who were vulnerable, who were just speaking their heart. It wasn't like cocky, clever, overeducated bullocks. And we organized in that way. And our leaders were the people who spoke from the heart. And I just realized this was, you know, this is an anarchist, beautiful thing. And then Extinction Rebellion happened. So I was really involved in Extinction Rebellion. And we just done the world's first ever global citizens assembly um, in 2021. So I can speak about that a bit later. But again, all of these experiences just show our natural default mode is um, what you may, may this evening call anarchy. Um, over to my colleague, uh, the lovely Clive, the lovely Clive Russell, ladies and gentlemen. 
thank you jamie that's that's very kind and you're very lovely yourself um so i, I i'm clive um i'm i'm here in hackney in london uh the greatest borough in london bar none um i'm a designer um and i was uh i suppose my first experience of um of anarchism comes from that sort of that that sort of area um i was sort of heavily involved in the creation of a thing called the brixton pound um which was a local currency where we put david bowie on the front of the note and uh and that was my first sort of uh interactions and uh with the idea that actually these things can change people and change people's minds about how they look at different aspects of their life for instance with the, the brixton pound obviously it made people think well this is one this is cool because it's got bowie and it also had two black people on notes but also um i can go and spend it in my local area and i can only spend it in my local area and then it, you know suddenly pennies started to drop of well why isn't this the norm why is this why why do we have central banks and such like so and then you now i met the wonderful jamie via extinction rebellion so i did a lot of the the initial design work with uh, some great friends of mine um and uh and then sort of uh then met david later during that process and nika as well and uh we all sort of continue to work and collaborate together really um and i'll pass uh to steve thank you clive um so i i'm steve bachelor i'm in the uh, united states the greater boston area i guess i identify as an academic because i spend my life teaching and reading and writing um and always seem to have a, a school that's providing income to help me teach and read and think and write. Um, I got interested in direct action at a very young age. I grew up in a city that if you're from the United States, um, in, Los, in the greater LA area, where Richard Nixon, the former president, uh, uh, was born and raised. Well, not born, but at least raised, went to high school. So he and I share a, uh, a a, a sordid past and he went one direction and I went another and my first experience in direct action was as a sixth grader taking over as part of a collective effort of kids who were into skateboarding and dirt bikes we took over a section uh, an unused section of our uh, on the outskirts of our school and turned it into a skate park and a and a dirt bike area. And five years later, the bulldozers came and tore it down. And by that point, I was interested in punk rock and Karl Marx simultaneously. And um, if you fast forward about to 1997, um, that's when I discovered David Graeber's scholarship. And I became a fan um something i guess of a groupie almost and followed his work and have been a big fan of his um and when he died nika put out a, a call uh, the this wonderful generous gesture to just invite people whose lives were touched by david graber to come together and it's now two years and a couple months later and we're we're still inspired or at least i'm inspired by his work and through nika and the museum of care have come to know this wonderful group of people who share a similar commitment to non-hierarchical ways of of living as if we're already free because there's no reason why we can't be we're human i will pass to my lovely and brilliant colleague a woman who i many times call the smartest person I know, Simona. Wow. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, what to say? Uh, I'm an anarchist, uh, if uh, we call anarchism a coherent uh, refusal of a 
any form of coercion or oppression. Um, I don't know if I can call myself uh, such because I work for, um, for the government in a healthcare uh, organization and I strongly believe it's uh, important and useful to do such a thing. Um, because uh, well, healthcare is uh, uh, basic, important for everybody. Um, at the moment, uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm proudly a member of the housekeeping committee of the Museum of Care, and also I'm uh, part of a group uh, here in Bologna, Italy. Um, of a group of anarchists uh, in a new squatted place uh, we are very proud of. Uh, we organized a, labora a workshop uh, of uh, political philosophy, of popular political philosophy, and we are discussing David Weber's uh, uh, work uh, in, this, uh, in this framework. Um, well, I, I think it's... Uh, all from me, and uh, I need to see the participants. Um, Billy, can uh, I pass to you? Um, sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm Billy. Um, I don't know very much about anarchism. Um, I think I've watched like some podcasts with um, like Michael Malice and like Lex Friedman, I think is the main one where they talk about it. So that's kind of as much as I know, um, yeah, I'm just interested in, in kind of learning more. I'm based out of San Francisco, uh, software engineer uh, by day. Um, I'll pass it off to Naloy. Hey, uh, I'm based out of San Francisco as well. Uh, just like Billy, um, I don't know a lot about anarchism, although I'm an avid reader of history and I would love to learn a, a lot from today's discussion. I'll pass it on to Charlie. Charlie. Okay, well, I guess we'll keep the San Francisco chain going a bit longer here. Um, so I am an economist and I work at the kind of intersection of economics and the legal system here in the United States, um, mostly related to environmental issues and competition policy issues. Um, yeah, and I've been along for the ride for a number of the uh, salons in this series and excited for today's conversation. Um, so I will pass it to Mike. Hi, I'm Mike. I'm in Nottingham in the UK. Um, what I do, I kind of draw cartoons. I'm part of a quite a large um, self-organised community in Nottingham, but they're um, none of them are explicitly anarchist. Um, and I don't tell them what I'm doing. Um, and that's me. Um, I have no, I have no memory. So if you haven't gone, just wave at me and I'll shout your name out. So we have Brian, Sarah, and Dan. Brian, you're next. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm a writer, podcaster based in London. I have a kind of long but inexplicit connection to anarchism. I, I got really interested at uni in Taoism and Tolstoy, basically. And at the same time, I was taking Western philosophy and this kind of problematic attitudes towards logic, hierarchy, and causality, and all these other things, as opposed to complexity and some of the stuff that, that's going on in those other philosophies has been bothering me for many years. I kind of started a discussion group in London. And during that time, I started reading more sort of political history and stuff like that. And people wanted to read Hayek and all these other things. And we ended up kind of going into Kropotkin, a friend of mine, who's now a published author, he wrote about the CIA's intervention in Indonesia. His name is Vincent Bevins. And he actually went to high school with me in Southern California. He had been telling me for years and years that I must read David Graeber. And so that year I, I read Debt and Bullshit Jobs and Utopia of Rules and several others, um, as well as James C. Scott and a few other people. And that's when I really got 
interested in anarchism. So yeah, it's been a, a, a recent interest at sort of the last four or five years, um, but I'm really happy to meet other people who are also interested in, in this topic uh, because I, you know, had a, let's say, opposition in with from within my discussion group. <laughs> Oh, and sorry, uh, Dan. Hi there. Um, yeah, I'll have to have my camera off for a lot of this, I think, just because I'm at home with my family and uh, I've got kids running around and I have to cook. And uh, I'm sure you don't want to watch me chop onions. So that's quite, that's quite every day, I guess, which is a bit anarchistic. Um, I have been interested in anarchism for a long time it's the political philosophy that i've read the most of not particularly deeply though i used to regularly read um, an american magazine called anarchy a journal of desire arms which used to publish uh, pieces about um contemporary workers struggles and anarchism i'm a fan of freedom the magazine out of london I've read quite a few of Colin Ward's books, who is, um, yeah, he's, he's a really brilliant writer on anarchism, and he makes it seem very everyday, as well as the situationist stuff. But I haven't really done much political activism at all. Um, I am in a sort of career transition at the moment where I'm switching over to being a psychotherapist, and the person who's most influenced me in that is... Um, a guy called Wilhelm Reich, or Reich, um, and he is, um, he was the first person to sort of, he was, he was a Marxist at the time, but he later rejected Marxism, and he kind of applied a Marxist lens to looking at large political movements, and he wrote a book called The Mass Psychology of Fascism, and some of his later sort of political stuff is pretty, he called it work democracy, but it's, it's, seems pretty close to anarchism to me um another interest of mine as well has been the syrian civil war and i think you can see a lot of anarchist type mutual aid kind of taking place and happening um i wasn't really i didn't really follow stuff from rojva as much but i think you could see there's lots of evidence of mutual aid happening uh in aleppo before the russians went in um in the other Arab areas. So I think that's a really interesting potential. I, th I think looking at how anarchisms might take hold outside of the Western world, I think is a really fruitful area for, for discussion. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to have to have my camera off for a lot of this, but um, it's just because I'm at home uh, with family. So I'll be I'll be I'll probably be dipping in and out a little bit. And I will hand over to Sarah, who I think is in a friend of mine, who I think is also in the chat. Okay, so yeah, um, I think Sarah disappeared. Uh, so yeah. uh, I'm looking at you, but I think we are at the end of the uh, round of introductions. Thank you so much, all. It's uh, really great to have such a diverse group here. So um, I think our conversation is going to be uh, fascinating as usual in this uh, series. Um, let me ask the first question, uh, but then, you know, as always, uh, if anyone has anything to add, uh, to comment, to ask, uh, uh, just uh, use the raise hand option and uh, very soon you will have the floor for yourselves. So, um, and I'm turning to Nika now. Uh, in When you're emailing uh, as preparation to this salon, uh, you wrote me an interesting quote. And it was like uh, that anarchism is something you do. It's not an identity or, or uh, membership in an organization. It's really what you do. Um, I would like to ask you to elaborate this a little bit. What did you mean? Um, yeah, I mean, like anarchism is uh, the way how you relate to people for me and how you constitute social relationship. And as everybody was um, uh, describing how they the first time find out about anarchism, I 
would tell about myself. And so I grew up in Leningrad, in former Soviet Union. Uh, that was uh, a city where Russian avant-garde uh, started to like emerge. And these two giants of Russian avant-garde, Malevich and Filonov, both uh, in their artistic and political practices, I would say, were really connected to anarchism. Uh, Malevich was writing to the newspaper called Sanarchy, and um, also in the way uh, of all of his uh, political beliefs and how he, also, he um, he constitutes his artistic practices. It's it's uh, it's very much anarchistic, and that's why both of these artists and Russian avant-garde, of course, were not uh, welcome in the newly formed state. Um, and yeah, and I, I and another thing I think about anarchism is really not necessary to. Uh, so it doesn't require to have this label uh, to, to the things that you're doing. And I agree with Jamie, who I hope will describe us uh, his fascinating uh, direct action that he is engaged with um, Citizens Assembly. But I want to also uh, talk about amazing project that just finished now, Documenta 15, that was like one of the major event in the art world um, uh, where, 1,500 artists participated uh, under the curatorial of uh, people from Indonesia called Ruan Group. Um, and I just want to read how they, uh, how they describe themselves. They introduced this principle called Lumbung, that is uh, an Indonesian word that translated rice barn. So they didn't talk about anarchism at all, I think even once. Uh, more, more than that, they didn't even use English words to, and that's very important, <laughs> to, to describe their practices. But if you read what they say, and if you see what they did, uh, to me, I would consider them to be like totally 100% uh, executing anarchist practices. So Lumbung directly translates rice barn is a collective port or accumulation system used in rural areas of Indonesia where crops produce by a community uh, and store as a future share common resources and distribute it accordingly to join the uh, determined criteria. Using Lumbung as a model, Documenta 15 is a collective resource board operating under the logic of commons. It is an agglomeration of ideas, stories, uh, uh, woman, man, power, time, and other shared resources. At the center of Lumbung is an imagination and the building of this collective shared resources into a new model of sustainable ideas and cultural practices. This will be foreseen by the residents, assemblies, public activities, and development of tools. And one of the absolutely unusual thing that was introduced by Documenta for the Western art world uh, was uh, is breaking separation between production and consumption, between people who visiting to see the art and the people who were producing art, because they did really create a lot of these common spaces where you can co-create and do things together. And it wasn't, you know, artists training like non-professional people, but it's actually really doing things together. I can give more examples um, later on. And that's actually delete the notion of experts. That's very important and very unusual for the for the West. Yeah. Anyone would like to comment or ask a question related to this? Yeah, yeah, just to just remind uh, just what you were saying there, Nika just made me uh, I can't remember who, who it was now. I think it might be Mike, but punk rock. So I'm a middle class kid from South London and the first time I heard the word anarchy was I am and, uh, you know, was uh, the, the Sex Pistols, right? And um, what was really interesting with punk rock, right? And I, I, I had the good fortune of being friends with Joe Strummer, who was in The Clash, right? And what was what they were brilliant for was there was no backstage. So when the band finished, they wouldn't like, okay, bye-bye audience, we're going to, you know, we're going to snort cocaine on our own backstage. It was just like there was no division between the audience and the band. And they were really strong on saying, no, don't fucking talk to me like I'm a celebrity, mate. You go and learn to play bass. 
your own band. And I, I, we just thought we'd never seen that before. And it was just such a brilliant, brilliant thing, you know, that the, the, the breakdown between uh, artists and audience was just smashed completely, right? And, and uh, you, you just, Nika just made me think of that just then, but. Um, Jimmy, you were also called by Nika to talk a little bit about your project, the citizen uh, assemblies. So if you wouldn't mind, then I'd like to ask you to introduce this project a little bit. It's yeah, it'd be a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. yeah it'd be a pleasure. Um, so there's, so I, I'm of the opinion, right, that you're not going to deal with the climate crisis or the, the cost of living crisis, any of these crises, the, the perpetual wars for the last resources, all of these crises you cannot deal with unless you deal with the crisis in governance itself, how humanity decides. Our decision-making processes are embarrassing and ancient, and they're going to kill us. And so, um, you know, with these kind of movements, what we call the movement of the squares in 2011, right? So, you know, that's when the Occupy movement happens, the Indignados in Spain, Syntagma Square, Taria Square, the whole of North Africa, right? This, this movement of the squares was fascinating because it was just people meeting in the square and saying, surely we can do better than this. And yet that was profoundly incendiary. And most countries, governments were terrified <laughs> of people having that conversation. And we organized ourselves, you know, you know, our Arguably, David invented this whole thing, you know, that we are the 99%. Everyone says David came up with that, right? So it's really simple stuff. And we're meeting in huge squares and we use participatory democracy assemblies. So no voices dominate, no leaders, everybody's voices are heard equally. And you set it up in a way whereby people who feel vulnerable feel okay, comfortable to speak. All right. And that was a big deal. So instead of having highly educated, I've got a bloody degree in Karl Marx up me ass people, it was just basically ordinary people feeling safe to say what they feel, you know, like visceral politics. Yeah. And I, I, I found when people who don't have agency get agency, they're the bomb. That's where the change is. No doubt about it at all. OK. And then you grow this idea into what's happening now. Right. And so now there's this glowing, growing, no, glowing grow, global movement in, in um, these new systems of governance. You know, in America, they're called citizen juries. Um, in, uh, in, in France, they're called mini publics. Um, in the UK, they're called citizens assemblies. Right. But they've all got two things in common. So one is they are chosen through sortition, which is. A, a, like a random lottery style system, okay, um, that ends up with an accurate snapshot of, of that society. So that's one thing they've got in common. The other thing they've got in common is, is basically bringing those people together. They are given a, a 360 degree understanding of an issue. And then we trust them to come up with better solutions than our governments can ever manage, okay? So I think what Nico wanted me to talk about um, is, is the world's first ever global citizens assembly that we did in 2021. So you can look it up, you know, if you do uh, in Twitter, you can do underscore global assembly or globalassembly.org. But what we did was the first time ever we heard what the human family itself sounds like when you bring it together. That was just crazy. So these were chosen by sortition. So that meant, you know, I was on the edge of my seat. Yeah, thank you. I was on the edge of my seat because of a bloody algorithm, right? Because we watched this world map and the algorithm was um, uh, random longitude and latitude and population density. So when these points landed, there were 18 in China and 17 in India, 14 in, in Africa, one in, Coventry in the UK, one on an island off Yemen, um, uh, eight in, uh, no, nine in, in Latin America, South America. And these points landed. And then we worked with community groups within 50 kilometers of those points. And they had to 
find six strangers. So each of those points, six strangers were found. Couldn't be a friend, couldn't be a friend on Facebook, couldn't be a family member or colleague. You had to walk up to strangers in the street. Would you be interested in being in the Global Assembly? So then when you have the 600, algorithm number two boils that down to 100. So it's an accurate snapshot of humanity. So that was based on things like um, economic background, education, race, gender, previous views on climate, because this assembly was on climate. So you ended up with 10% with no formal education, 70% uh, living on $10 or less a day, 18% Chinese, 13% white, 50% women. And they were brought together for 68 hours over 11 weeks and they had translators, community people supporting them, you know, so, so many of them had never seen a computer before, right? And, and uh, so they had to be really supported and they went through 68 hours learning about climate change from climate scientists, from indigenous wisdom keepers, from people, Nigerian leaders of the oil industry in Nigeria. So they got a really full understanding and then we trusted them to come up with a final declaration. So they came up with the People's Declaration on the Climate and Ecological Crisis that was presented at the Glasgow Climate Conference uh, six times, like four times in the blue zone, yeah? And we got Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, uh, Alok Sharma, who was the UK President of, of the Climate Conference, Nicola Sturgeon, Vanessa Nakate, all these big that voices came out saying, this is, you know, this is what we want to see, you know, but they were just saying that. But the fact is, we heard what the human family had to say. We felt what the human family felt like, more to the point. So, so this is my last thing, and then I'll, I'll shut up. But I think this is beautiful, and, and it's a joy to share this, right? I'm telling you now that the default mode the default mode for humanity is love, compassion, a willingness to cooperate, and a desire for a sustainable future for our children. Every single member of the human family that was brought together, that's, that was their default mode. And, and, and I used to observe them, you know, so they had breakout groups, it was fucking 68 hours, right? And they were breakout groups. And I'd, I'd, so I'd have my screen off, right? I have my mic off, right? Um, and what a good thing that I had my mic off and my screen off because I was fucking crying. I really mean it. And I'm not, I'm not some hippie, right? It was the reality. And then you feel ashamed of where we've come to when you get reminded of what we are. We've come so far away from what we are. So these kinds of mechanisms are, are, are really where this this new movement is, is building, right? And we're gonna take it into civil disobedience next year. And I'm working with, I won't name them on this because it's been recorded, but I'm working with some groups and some countries where their countries are collapsing and their, their movements, which have been brutally oppressed, their movements are working with my crew to rebuild their country using sortition chosen citizens' assemblies or, or citizen juries, whatever you want to call it, right? And it's got a long way to go, right? It's, it's this far off the fucking ground so far, all right? It's only got this far, but it's already immensely better than the embarrassment that we're stuck in, you know? So there's a lot of humility in the movement. We welcome mistakes because we, we want to improve and improve and improve and improve, right? But already it's way better than what is going to kill us otherwise, you know? So those are the kind of things that I think Nico wanted me to share with you in an emotional way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyone has a question? Or uh, anyone would like to add something to this? Could I ask yes. a question? Um, sure, then go ahead. Running the, um, yeah, uh, when you were running the Citizens' Assemblies, um, was there any way or did you do anything to stop kind of vested interest groups kind of dominating and pushing their own agendas because mm. i wondered if you would have a load of like i don't know you know how kind of socialist workers workers party over here kind of uh parasite onto every 
demonstration that ever happens. How does <laughs> how does that kind of how do you prevent that kind of dynamic taking place in citizens' assemblies? Yeah, that's that's really where it's at, Dan, man. So so I'd say ninety percent of the models that are happening around the world at the moment that they're not independent. That there are you pull back the curtain and there's the SWP or, mm -hmm. or there's or, the, or there's the equivalent, right? You know, the famous French French Citizens Assembly on climate, that was heavily criticized because when you pull back the curtain, it was being run by, you know, lefties and greenies. Obviously, we've got I've got nothing against lefties and greenies, but the fact is it has to be purely it has to be pure, it has to be independent. And mm -hmm. um, it's very rare that it is, but the movement that we're that we're pioneering is all about it being independent for exactly the reasons that Dan's pointing it out. Because what can happen is, you know, it, it's 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 nudged one way or the other, you know, and that and that's where the art is. I mean, I'm working with these people who are pioneers in this field. In my opinion, they're the most revolutionary people I've ever worked with, but they're really nerdy. They're basically process geeks. And they are obsessed with keeping it as pure as possible, keeping out those those unneeded influences that, that Dan's talking about. And obviously, if we just go by normal govern, governance, they're all run by vested interests. There's, there's no like interest of the people. That's way down the list, right? But with these new models, the whole idea, one of the main ideas is, is to keep that independence, to keep it from being co-opted. And it's so easy for it to be co-opted. So it's, it's a precarious situation. Um, but it is definitely something that people are really very much attending to. Thank you. Uh, Charlie? Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, just bringing it back to the, the topic of the salon today, anarchism, how do these um, global assemblies or other assemblies that you're talking about fit within that rubric? Um, you know, in what sense is it voluntary to be governed by these assemblies? Um, you know, I, I don't recall signing up to be governed by the, the global assembly. So, you know, how do those fit together? So there's, um, again, that's a really cool question, man. So, so there's, so this whole world, it's called deliberate, the deliberative wave, right? Delibwav. And, and it's at a T junction. All right. So half of them who I believe are very naive, they're saying, Right, we're going to go down this road, which is we want these models to be embraced by established power structures. OK, and obviously, I think probably for most of us on this meeting, that's a really naive and big mistake to make. Right. And then the other side is, is the ones who are saying, no, these ha we have to do a but mitzvah fuller. Right. So so what we're doing is we are creating we are claiming our own space establishing completely new power structures, independent of the established power structures, right? And we are pushing for civil disobedience, all right? And cultural disruptions to force social mandate, a social mandate supporting these independent, separate structures from established power. That's where we're at at the moment, all right? So in other words, we, we have no power in the eyes of existing power structures. We have to force that. So this is where you have this triangle, right? Which is civil disobedience, cultural wave, and citizens' assemblies, the three C's, right? And this all has to work because we're not naive. And so when I say it's about Mr. Fuller, what I'm saying is we are creating an alternative system that makes the first system obsolete, as, as Bucky said, you know? Yeah, Nika? Yeah, I don't know, actually, it's very interesting for me to find out from Jamie, what is the plan, but uh, so my understanding would be, I also don't want to be governed by the citizens assembly that, you know, I didn't create myself, <laughs> uh, or I, I, I should see what kind of assembly is this, where I'm living, you know, particularly in my area, but the idea is like, we have to try to create our local structures and then make a federation uh, with one another. There is no one global assembly that could, could then uh, uh, rule everyone, but it's probably how I understand the ideal situation. It's a variety of issues 
that could be um, governed on different levels by different groups. And if I come back to Documenta, how they did it, so it was a group of curators who was running the, everything, but then they delegated to many, many other alternative groups who, who they invited originally and who came and live uh, in Documenta and each of this group were deciding for themselves what they're going to do. And, uh, and it's, it's has some, uh, yeah, some kind of uh, flaws and problems. But as Jamie said, it's so much way better than any other form of uh, decision making or implementing power than, uh, than we have now that, you know, I think every, every conscious person will choose that. But so suppose that you were able to wrest, um, you know, power from the existing structure. So suppose that, you know, my neighborhood in San Francisco gets its, you know, full autonomy, they can do whatever they want. And, you know, this organization forms, you know, would the idea be that I could say, well, you know, if my neighbors want to sign up for that, that's fine. But, you know, in this floor of this house, you know, that's, we're not going to be governed by that. Or, with the solution for me to be, well, if you don't want to be part of this community, then you need to leave the community and it would be to move out. Well, I think a weirder thing to ask yourself is why haven't you got a choice of a different community? Because at the moment we only have one choice. So if you had a choice to actually go to a different community that was operating really well, um, you could then make that choice. But at the moment we have no choice at all. We are told there is only one way to lead our lives and that is this way, this Western way that we have, and no other ways are, are valuable in any way, which is ridiculous. That's such a ridiculous concept. What? Why would that be the case? You know, why would this method of governance be the only the best way of governing ourselves? That just makes no sense. It's uh, you know, surely we need to be constantly looking to evolve and get better and you know, all of those sort of things, but our social, our society itself hasn't moved on for the last 300 years, as far as I can see. And that's that's appalling. So really, we, we should be asking ourselves, why on earth hasn't this ha already happened? And why aren't we living in a society where we can make choices which society we live in? Yeah, and if, if I uh, also may express my opinion, I think you, if I understand you're asking quite practical question, for example, you live in a, house, in a building and uh, your building or the bunch of buildings uh, make an assembly and then you disagree with them. Uh, and so I lived in the US for quite a long time. Uh, many apartment buildings in New York already have this some kind of assembly, you know, with a very strict rules. Uh, and I think this is the only way how it may work. So, for example, if you start to create a lot of noise or so don't take out trash, then you will be kicked out and that's okay, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so that's basic rules uh, in every social ability. They're already anarchistic in a way because otherwise you wouldn't be able to live with people. So, but we're talking about more, um, uh, like, more global issues in a way that uh, why Jamie was talking about assembly on climate change. When mm, people yeah, mm. I mean, these are all, like I say, Charlie, that this is like, we're only that far off the ground, right? So there's all these kinds of issues that are being addressed, but already it feels a lot better than what we've got. And as, as Clive said, you know, it's, it's crazy that we don't even challenge the governance systems that often and think about they could be better. But I, I, I want to leave you with something that I think um, is really helpful. Um, you know, the polarization of our lives, is, our atomization of our lives, and polarization of society is it's just it's just it's just crash, crushing our souls, right? And um, you know, and that's exacerbated by Cambridge Analytica style crazy technology, digital propaganda, right? But I want to give you a story that I think really opens up something beautiful in this so that polarization that gets really addressed in these citizens assemblies and there was a citizens assembly on um same-sex marriage in ireland right so you know in ireland right if you if you're a politician and you have an opinion about same-sex marriage and an abortion your political career is over whatever your whatever your opinion is so they had they had citizens assemblies about them right because these are 
issues that the politicians wouldn't say anything. Yeah. So famously, in the same-sex marriage assembly, chosen by sortition, there was an elderly postman from south of London, Cork, uh, sorry, south of Ireland, uh, a place called Cork, right? And he was an absolute sort of cartoon version of a raging, murderous homophobe. And he, and he kept sitting at the same table as this young guy, young gay man who was very camp in, in his like ways of behaving, right? He was very camp. And they kept sitting at the same table over, what is it, what is it? Uh, uh, I think 12 weekends. And, and the old homophobe wanted to kill this kid, wanted to kill him. Fast forward 12 weekends. So the process is finished. Old homophobe, arm round young kid. I would fucking die for this kid. He's changed my life. He's the grandson I'd never had. I fucking love him because I've spent my whole life. I'll stop the Irish accent now, right? But he's saying, because I've spent my whole life filled with hate and fear because of something that happened to me when I was a kid. So I won't go, you know, I won't trigger anyone, but this homophobe had an awful situation when he was a kid. And he's going, and this young man has made it possible for me to, to tell that story and to share that story. And I would die for him. So he's gone from this profound homophobia to a complete change in values and understanding and sense of self-being, right? So here is one of the many unexpected effects of these new systems of governance, which is the end of polarization. And you can see it everywhere. You know, in America, famous story of Republican woman and, and, and Democrat woman, I, I would cross the street rather than look her in the eye. And then by the end of them meeting, now they're best friends and they exchange fucking cake recipes every weekend. And, you know, this goes on and on and on. The end of polarization, it, it, it happens very quickly. Sorry, um, I think this, oh, anyway, anyway, I'll be quiet for a bit. Thanks. In the meantime, Niloy had a question in the chat, but uh, now he writes that uh, what you uh, said, Jamie, actually answered his uh, question. Um, I would like to uh, ask something here. So when we're talking about these uh, citizens assemblies, the global citizen uh, assemblies, these are, uh, we can call them grassroots movements, right? So they are uh, building, uh, yeah. Uh, um, in Budapest, uh, in Hungary, uh, and I know that it's a bit surprising to hear something like this from Hungary, but uh, we had something similar uh, uh, in the year, uh, but it was started uh, by the municipality. So it was the uh, leadership of the city that organized such uh, citizens' uh, assemblies um, well, in order to have them govern better. Um, what do you think about this? So do these also fit in this category? Yeah, they're famous. So it's one of the first examples of, of um, government embedding these processes. And actually those assemblies are given, um, I think if, if, the, if the assembly reaches 80% agreement, then the government will implement what they have agreed on. So in other words, the ones that you're talking about, Robert, they are one of the first examples of this becoming part of established power structures, but the power structures giving power to them. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's, you know, that's actually one of the ones that's referenced a great deal. And then there are other ones like the French Assembly on Climate Change, where Macron said, I will agree to everything they say. <laughs> And then when, when they finished, he didn't agree to any of it because it was all, you know, it, it, didn't, it went against the whole power structure, you know. But the example that you're giving is, is one of the really hopeful, you know, new, new examples of what we're saying. This is, this is at the first stages. But, I, you know, I, I, can, I can see this as, as, as being a profoundly important tool in humanity getting out of what I would call is the chapter of shame and embarrassment, you know. Yes, Christina. 
Um, I had a more, I had a broader question. I guess it might be an oversimplification to say this, but in some ways I think about anarchists as building systems outside the mainstream in order to build something better or influence the mainstream. And I think about sometimes liberalism is about reforming the mainstream and Marxism is about revolution. And I'm just wondering like, can um, anarchism or maybe not even calling it anarchism, but building um, an alternative system to influence the um, mainstream system or the system in power, can that, look, can that work like alongside people who are trying to reform from the inside, like can those two kind of groups meet together and work together and what your all's th thoughts are on that? Anyone can weigh in? Well, I feel like I'm doing shit loads of talking. Is that okay if I give you an answer though? Because no one else is gonna say anything. So, I just think Steve please. was just Steve was just about oh, to talk a bit. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll try to uh, offer some some thoughts. I I think that's a a, a really uh, wise and astute point. One of the the problems with anarchist thought is because it is a an ethics of practice rather than a mode of analysis it tends to become ways of behaving, of acting rather than, which means in terms of branding, it's difficult because it means that the actions that, that so-called anarchists who, I mean, anarchists may, be even, may even have trouble with that term because it is kind of a, a, a category. It's, it's a, a delimiting. And so if you start from the premise that there's entropy, there's sort of action happening everywhere, then really what culture is, is, is at root a refusal. And so if you are practicing an ethics of practice that has refusals as the guiding light, because you're refusing to behave in ways that go against ways that you as a human would want to be treated. And so it's putting into practice the golden rule, but we tend not to think of the golden rule as a refusal. That is the refusal to treat you as anything but a, as a, as a, a friend or a non-stranger. It doesn't mean that there isn't hierarchy but you're approaching people first with the assumption of a shared humanity. So it's built on a premise of refusal, which then means as, as an intellectual tradition, it doesn't get codified in the form of particular modes of analysis, Leninism, Marxism, Maoism. It instead gets enshrined as an antithetical tradition to the traditions of violence that surround us. And so it absolutely has to begin from either building alternative structures outside the structure or alternative structures within the structure, but recognizing that the structure itself is a corpse and you're building a fresh start from within the shell of the old. And that, you know, doesn't, it, it's then difficult to identify because what will then happen is people will sometimes get to the point where if you're building within the shell of the old, you're a sellout. <laughs> Not necessarily, but that is where, you know, so do you refuse to build outside of the shell or do you build inside the shell? I think it's a, I think it's a both and that's where really the rubber hits the road because then when those who refuse to do both hand thinking if it's followed by violence then you know you're no longer dealing with an anarchist okay okay charlie Thanks. I, I want to come back to something that Jamie said that I found a little surprising. Um, 
you know, when I hear anarchism is really about voluntary associations and letting those, you know, really blossom and proliferate, that strikes me as a way to make a much more atomistic society than the one that we have now. Because, you know, I don't like everything that the city of San Francisco has decided to do or the United States of America has decided to do. But if I can find my little enclave that I want to be, that I really mesh with, that I match with, you know, I could find my group of 50 people that all want to, you know, follow the same norms, follow the same rules. And, you know, my neighbor could find their 50 people and then my other neighbor could find their 50 people. And so to me, it seems like it could be really, um, you know, disintegrating in terms of how, um, you know, our, our broader communities, neighborhoods, countries are built together, even if it creates much tighter bonds within the, the community that you do end up choosing. So I was kind of curious, um, you know, how you see that playing out. Yeah, I, I, if, I understand, if I understand correctly, um, I think the, the the thing that you need to make a point about here is um, you don't choose these groups, right? It's sortition. So, I mean, I, I'm probably just being dumb, Charlie, actually, I'm afraid. So it, it, sortition is the method by which these groups come together. So they are, by definition, completely not all of the same type of person. They are actually you know, all, all the different aspects of a society, uh, you know, literally a snapshot. So it's not, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people kind of have problems with participatory democracy and deliberative democracy and participatory democracy, that's self-selected. So I think if I understand what you're saying, Charlie, um, participatory democracy is where it's self-selected. So these are the, you know, we all come together. This is my gang. These are the people who I feel sympathetic with, you know, um, but what I'm talking about is, sortition chosen deliberative democracy so what that means is it's not your gang it is by definition um a snapshot of everybody you know so it's usually divided into race gender age economic and educational background and one's opinion about that issue you know so with the global assembly 13 percent of the people who were chosen um had the opinion that uh, climate change is not an emergency at all it's not a problem on the same-sex marriage one, I think, again, they had a, a certain percent that had a, a, a set opinion about same-sex marriage for and same-sex marriage against. Um, but these and so these are not self-selected. They're not participatory democracy. They're not the gang you feel comfortable with at all. They're meant to be a much wider representation. I'm probably being dumb, Charlie. Sorry, you're asking a question. I probably no, maybe the that. reason why, you know, we're talking past each other a bit is that to me does not sound like anarchy. To me, my understanding mm. of an anarchistic system is one where I volunteer to join a particular group mm. Mm. Uh, um, as opposed to what you're describing, which is kind of a different way to create a body that represents everyone or represents um, you know, a particular population. Yeah, yeah, and I've got, yeah, yeah. So this is not anarchism in, in that definition. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's not people volunteering. It, it, it's, well, it's people saying that they'll go for it, but it's, it, it, it's, then they ended up, they end up like being categorized in, into this place. It's not kind of willingly self-selected at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, but also, we, we was, uh, yeah, but Jamie was saying, and we said from the beginning, that for different um, matters, you have a different system. Like in Rojava, for example, uh, everything run by the uh, grassroots uh, committee who's come to consensus, but then they have a representative who's dealing with, uh, you know, outside world, for example. They are not government, mm -hmm. but they have a specific function and it's a centralized uh, place that is uh, talking to, to other countries, for example, and negotiating. So you have a different bodies uh, of decision-making and leaving. But what you're asking about atomization, I don't think you're right. So at least I would disagree with you. So when you have a central government uh, and everybody is um, kind of related uh, individually or family, like with the central command, then this is atomization. I know it very well because I lived in Soviet Union. But when you have these communities who know each other, affinity group, who then create a connection with the other affinity group, that's much more uh, human uh, uh, and less atomized uh, human society. Because 
you you would be able to have time to nurture the relationship you know you know your people or your neighbors and you try to 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 deal with them somehow and that exists in any case you know anywhere like you you study somewhere in the class you have classmates you have neighbors so this the centralized system is only breaking down this relationship uh but they exist anyhow because we're social social creatures simona Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, yes, I wanted to go back to the problem uh, with categorization. Um, on one side, uh, uh, categories and names, definitions are essentials because they are uh, uh, like standards in a battle. They allow you to recognize uh, your uh, comrades. Uh, those uh, uh, you you wish to be together in um, the share your ideas uh, and uh, it's helpful to find people um, and uh, from this point of view I have a sort of a anarchist detector uh, when I like somebody, <laughs> it's usually uh, a deeply anarchist person. And, but there's a great problem with categorization because uh, it creates uh, an uh, inside and an outside. It, it, it's a, any definition is, uh, uh, is in a way uh, violence. Um, and that's why I'm, wary of defining myself in any way, be it anarchist uh, or uh, other. Um, because uh, as soon as you define, uh, you create a border, you create uh, exactly as uh, somebody said earlier, uh, you join a particular group. And uh, uh, it is a uh, setting apart that is dangerous for me. I want an ethics and a politics that can be for everyone potentially. And uh, to be for every, everyone also means uh, uh, there is no blame for those uh, not, not joining. And this is a dynamic I see in my Bolognian group um, that is potentially dangerous. Um, an idea that this is a group, this is a, this is a very um, welcoming group, uh, very non-hierarchical, very non-violent. Nevertheless, uh, there is an idea of uh, blaming those outside. And this is, uh, in my opinion, uh, dangerous. Um, I prefer something that is uh, that can be shared uh, with everybody, and uh, uh, I'm very I'm worried of uh, the potential. Anytime, anytime you create a definition and an identity, you create a border and you create a sort of violence, and you create a hierarchy, even if you are not aware of it. Any questions or comments? In the meantime, uh, Christine and Brian are having a fascinating conversation in the chat about uh, uh, Taoism and uh, and uh, Buddhism. Maybe you could uh, 
you know, introduce these concepts a little bit to, to the others who are not necessarily familiar with, with those? I'd love to hear you, Christina. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to speak for all this. I'm not <laughs> as an authority, but um, I've practiced Vajrayana, which is a Tibetan form of Buddhism, for a while, um, and a lot of it is one of one aspect of the practice is um, breaking down attachment to like concrete um views on yourself and of the world um though that what i was saying in the chat that does not mean you just reject everything and, and are nihilistic either it means you just don't cling too tightly so i could be somebody for example that identified maybe as an anarchist um but i might talk to my friend over there who's a liberal and not just be like oh i can't talk to you like i can't engage with this i found the right thing this is my thing I'm like I and um, I found that I guess I'm just very drawn towards like dialectical ways of thinking, um, and that doesn't mean that every side is equally necessarily right or has the truth, but it means there's maybe a piece of the truth in everyone's individual experience that they that people most people aren't sociopaths and even if they're drawn to political philosophies that seem really alien to me, there might be something in that that's resonating, and so a big you know, a big part of my practice in Buddhism is breaking down um, my own biases and realizing that, you know, I can identify with certain things, but over identifying with them um, can create suffering because I can't hear other people's piece of the truth. Um, so we were, I guess we were just kind of talking and I don't want to speak for Brian either. I'd be very curious to hear his perspective. Um, like yeah there's a there's a kind of a natural synergy there between both buddhism and taoism um and anarchy i think in that sense like these critiques of dominance um and i think like i'll try to find the essay but gary snyder this uh eco anarchist poet wrote a beautiful essay about kind of these similar things and i'll i'll find it in the chat um i'll post it in a second yeah thank you christina um uh, yeah, my background is sort of more, the, my practice is more the Theravada Buddhism, which is kind of like, seems like um, earlier, I suppose, and, and it's kind of more stripped back, I, I suppose. But one thing that I that comes to mind with Taoism and Buddhism and anarchism is that they all seem to be about practice, right, or like practical action. Buddhism is very non-dogmatic in the way that it kind of, you know, it he, the Buddha is always saying, I only care about suffering and the end of suffering. And this is what you specifically do. It's not like having a, like you, the concepts can help you sort of get there, but they, they aren't the thing. Right. And the Tao Te Ching famously starts with the, the Tao that can be doubt or spoken about is not, not the one we're speaking about or not, not the eternal Tao. And so, and I think likewise with the kind of I, tension with anarchism you know, even it's like partly I feel very anti-authoritarian and always have been. Um, there's a joke because uh, when I was very young, my my <laughs> parents tried to put me into like, you know, kindergarten or whatever. And I was too anti-authoritarian to like basically do anything. So I ended up being what I guess would now be called un unschooled. Like I was not sent to school and not really given a curriculum or anything like that. And so um, uh, but that very anti-authoritarianism makes me resistant to say, oh, I'm going to join this group or, you know, like, or, or, and just a little bit wary of, of labels and things like that. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I'm, I'm very curious about what, you know, if, if anarchism is about action, like what are the specific actions? And also how do you find the others, I suppose? Um, because, you know, like, I would just say like a random search of, of uh, it's not like actually through the AI, I have found people that have like similar kinds of ways of, of thinking about these questions, but in my local community, it's not something that has really come up for me. And I, so I am very curious about like what specific actions do you take as an anarchist? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, uh, there is no specific action because then it will be described as a, you know, some kind of uh, fun group or political party or movements. And it's none of those. Uh, as I said in the beginning, for me, like this Rwanda group who 
clearly if you ask them if they're anarchists they would say no <laughs> probably what is that maybe uh, it's an indonesian collective uh, but they clearly oh maybe they will but, but they clearly practicing that very widely and that's why actually it's interesting Documenta is the biggest art exhibition in the world uh, they have like millions of uh, euros budget you know it's like very serious things and this was so radical to invite these people and they immediately clash with the system they didn't do anything violent you know they didn't like break the windows or anything but they were like uh, the old documenta was almost sus suspended because of their the way how they uh really practice their relationship with uh each other and with uh uh with the with the people who came for for documentaries so for me it's that's you just do what you do when you are in in this way and then and then that's that's it that will be the direct action but then maybe if i may ask um, i would like to ask clive uh who is actually uh, behind the design of extension rebellion i can show Maybe show some of his you know, our ocean rebellion, some of his posters that is in my apartment. Like they're amazing and very beautiful. And uh and this is a ex home exhibition about uh, uh 50 years of uh, political posters in the UK. Uh and in the beginning in the opening, Clive very beautifully described how his aesthetic was the way to also build the uh, the behavioral patterns inside uh, in the relationship with people who will um, who will use um, who will use the posters. So, and I think that's for me very very anarchistic way of dealing with uh, with visuality. Again, I wouldn't describe myself as an anarchist. I'd describe myself as a designer, um, and and it's sort of I suppose what what we did and what I've done a lot with most of most of my work I don't actually do myself I I collaborate with other people um and the idea really is to create how how little amount of work can you do and it's not just because I'm lazy um but I am slightly lazy but um but how little can you do to allow people to do a lot uh that aren't yourself and so with Extinction Rebellion it was create a font um and then uh, Miles did some um, woodcuts, um, you know, and a color scheme, uh, a logo that pre-existed, uh, the, the symbol pre-existed, it's an East London um, street artist, put them all together, package them up, give them away, and do that as quickly as you can. And then create workshops that show people how to make stuff together. And the great thing about making stuff together is that when you make stuff, you actually begin to talk to one another because it actually releases your you know by doing things with your hands suddenly your mouth starts to work and living in London if you've ever been on the underground in London nobody talks on the underground even though they're facing one another um, until they're drunk and then it's then it's then it's just rubbish that they're talking anyway um but it, actually if we yeah, you're all fighting if we actually get got everyone knitting on the underground maybe they'd all start talking and you know and it'd be it'd be a wonderful experience for people and I think you know this is this is what you must think about as a well I think about as a designer is how I make myself unimportant to what I do and how my practice isn't as an individual it's as a member of society so it's sort of I don't think of myself as an artist I don't think of myself as you know I'm a I'm a participant in life and uh and you know that 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 point of just getting people involved everyone can be a designer then why why should you know why do you have to go to a university to to become a designer I mean it's like uh everyone should be able to enjoy design and this is something William Morris talked about back in the 19th century Re, you know inspire people to with craft stop people going into big factories actually start making things yourself so so the, these aren't new ideas even these are just recycling ideas that have, have gone before and just finding new ways of doing them yeah and I just want to point out that it was very successful experiment because extension rebellion uh graphics and iconography I would say is like everywhere in the world like from India to uh 
to Ukraine, Russia, and everywhere else, US, and so on and so forth. So yeah, Clive, you're really modest. <laughs> Genuinely, we didn't do it. You know, this is the point. It's like, it's how the, the, this is, you know, okay, people say, oh, well, but if it wasn't me that did it, it would have been someone else. Uh, it just needs people to rethink how they approach things. This is taking basic ideas of design and turning them on their head. And, you know, so people talk about branding. This is taking principles of branding and chucking the manual out. That's all it's doing. And, uh, you know, there's nothing particularly clever about doing that. But it needs to be done at some point, at some time. And May '68 did it in France during the, um, the 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 riots or the uprising there. Um, so you know the, these are just learning, learn from the past, bring those practices forward into the present, and try and make change. And uh, that's that's sort of uh, you know. So it's not. I mean, I think it's relatively simple. It seems simple to me, anyway. Steve, you wrote in the chat that uh, you take anarchist practice to be more about what you refuse to do uh, than what you actually do. Could you please elaborate this a little bit more? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so if we start with the premise that we're born into society against our will, then no one has, I have not consented to anything except I refuse to kill myself in this moment. Because I refuse to kill myself in this moment, I'm now alive and I have choices. Those choices aren't necessarily ones that I've consented to. So again, there's a negative feedback loop there, unless we start with the premise that we are already free, that we're already free and therefore can live the way we want to. We can't really live the way we want to. So the best way I can define my life politically from a, from a viewpoint of political agency is by deciding what capitulations to authoritarianism or capitalism or system of authority of violence, structure of violence that I do not consent to, how can I organize my life so that I refuse at every step to capitulate to that system? Now at the extreme, of course, would be I kill myself, I self-immolate, I, self, I set myself on fire because I absolutely refuse to live with the suffering that is this world. At the other extreme is, well, I consider life as a game. And so I want to think at every time, at every moment, how can I rig the game in my favor? Now, it, without, a, without an ethics or a morality, that can, you know, that's the system we live in. So there are people who do consider life a game and are rigging that game in every way possible so that they succeed on their own terms. I want to succeed on my own terms, but my terms are not the terms of the world that I have refused to consent to, the, the world of authority. I've not consented to the world of authority, and yet I live in a life, I live in a world where I'm benefiting from that authority as, as a middle-aged white dude. And so I have great privilege. And so the privilege that I have is to refuse to reproduce systems of terror that do not have my consent. And yet I behave each day in a way that reproduces that system. The first step is making oneself aware of where those steps are so i have deliberately designed my life in ways sometimes where i'm not deliberately designing it but i try to design it deliberately in ways so that i am not reproducing structures of violence that i don't support at an ethical extreme you know i drive a car i have a bank account 
So there are certain capitulation. I have kids. <laughs> there are certain capitulations that are really, I don't like making. And so I'm always looking what for things that I can eliminate because those things build profit for other people that I don't want to profit through my existence, my capitulation to my refusal to kill myself. So I guess that's the way to kind of like spin that out as like an ethics of practice. Which means, <laughs> I mean, we live in a moral, this is a moral system. And so I, you know, I am making moral transgressions against my value system at every, in every moment. Um, I try to make myself as painfully aware of those capitulations, but in a, in a way where I'm not self-immolating and abusing myself and falling into traps of shame and guilt but i'm also not i hope falling into traps of the fallacies of material of materialism that seem to operate and guide many people and when i say materialism i don't mean a marxist analysis of materialism i mean people who are motivated by money for the sake of money. So it comes down to a means and ends kind of calculation. Knowing that anytime you calculate, if you bring in numbers, you're reducing things to false categories. Yes, Nika? You're muted. I want to give another example of the direct action is our friends uh, from um, from that from this temporary autonomous zone in uh, France, uh, John Jordan and crew. So they just built something very beautiful and yeah, and they defended actively and they exist for years. So now it's an example of how actually people can live without authority what kind of problems arise and how it's all developed. So that's like an amazing example of um, how things could work. And it's it's endless amount of communities like that everywhere. Like we did the opening of David Graeber Institute with the community from uh, Church of Stop Shopping from New York. And they have a, a friends from in London, the same, and they all operate in, uh, in the same way. So I don't know, I maybe can count uh, many, many places like that in the world. We are slowly coming to the end of our uh, time. Uh, I mean, in, in this salon, so uh, end of our 90 minutes. But if anyone has any questions left or, or topics uh, that they would like to talk about, uh, we will, of course, continue. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Yes, Christina? Um, I, I like, um, I'm particularly interested in this sort of offshoot of, um, that I've been hearing about, about Extinction Rebellion and these global citizens assemblies, because I hadn't, I was actually briefly in Extinction Rebellion in the US, but I, I didn't, I don't know, it didn't resonate with me when I was there. Um, and in the UK, I understand it's somewhat different. Um, is there, is, I know in a lot of anarchist movements, and I brought this up before, like mutual aid is often tied into part of this. And it sounds like there's these beautiful relationships that are happening in the citizens assembly where like walls are breaking down, connections are being formed. Has there been any kind of like organic mutual aid? I mean, I, I'm sure there has to be like once people make relationships with each other, they wanna help each other. Um, but yeah, just to connect, cause like I always found mutual aid being one of the most cool parts of anarchism and that whole philosophy. Yeah, that's, um 
so it's it's early days with the stuff that we're developing and that's really interesting what you're talking about because the, that was the first ever global citizens assembly and and of course what's happened is they've all they've all continued as a group and they've all developed networks within their own countries as a result of the experience of going through the assembly and as a result of the experience of learning about climate change so uh it, it's um, you know i know everyone uses this bloody analogy these days but it is like a mycelium network in the sense that there was the original network of the global assembly but then the participants themselves have started developing their own networks and, and not only the participants the assembly members but also the translators and the um, the note takers and the community hosts all of these groups have started developing their own networks as a result of it um and that wasn't encouraged that by us it just it just naturally developed um but it, it brings up something that i think is really worth bearing in mind is I was speaking to one of the assembly members the other day and he's the only UK one, right? And he was saying, um, I had to go and get therapy. And, and what's, what's one of the dangers or one of the lessons that we've got to learn is, you know, it's easy, if you're a climate activist, it's easy to kind of assume everybody knows how fucked we are and they don't. And so a lot of, and a lot of people who went through this experience, like in Pakistan, Farhat Parvi, you can see all this on our YouTube, by the way, Global Assembly YouTube, there's lots of films of them, right? But Lots of them were like Farhat Parveen, and she's on camera saying, until the Global Assembly, I thought all these floods were um, our sins and wrongdoings. It's only now that we know what it is, right? And so one of the areas that's incredibly important area for work is, is how you hold people who go through those experiences and how, how you hold them afterwards, all right? Psychologically, particularly if it's about climate change. But to answer your first bit, yeah, there's these networks that are growing organically. But again, that's something that's really worth learning more about and 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 finding ways where you can help that develop. You know what I mean? Rather than just keep your fingers crossed that it happens organically, there could be ways of encouraging that. The, these two areas are brilliant areas for us to be focusing on. You know, but it's all very early days. Yeah. And one, one, one other thing, Christina, actually, in the States, there is um, an organization called uh, of Buy for, Buy for Us, I think it is. Um, and it's uh, it, it's a major movement that's growing in the US. And it's about um, the same thing, the idea of replacing established power structures with these new uh, citizens juries, they're called in, in America, right? I'll try and find the link right now and put it into chat, but it's be worth following up on that. Anyone, any questions left or maybe final thoughts? Uh, I have, I have one. Uh, Go sorry, ahead. I have one, it's okay. Sorry, I, I missed a bit of a chat because um, I, uh, yeah, had to sort of sort of, uh, dinner out and everything here. Um, I, so I don't know what, you, what you've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, so forgive me if I am. But I wonder, could anybody talk about um, Rojva and learnings from Matt as a kind of, you know, what, you know, anybody who's studied it closely or looked at it closely, what kind of does the Rojva experience say um, for the possibilities of anarchist societies, I guess? Um, so I can. Great. I have never, I have never been in Rojava. I really want to go, but uh, uh, with David and I had friends uh, like translate of uh, Ajalan in English and uh, the daughter of Mary Bookchin, and so yeah, looks like Rojava is a. Uh, uh, for for many years now, in fact, nine, ten years, they were like really practicing uh, and showing how it's working on the ground. Uh, this uh, if it, if it, uh, this kind of anarchism that we were told it would never work because it's uh, all kind of different people, Muslims and Christians and Jews and this and that, all living together in Middle East, where we know everybody's killing each other. 
more than that, they are under attack, constant attack. They are under sanctions. Nobody's helping them really. Uh, so it's like most horrible condition possible. And still, you know, the, they run by the grassroots assemblies. There is uh, real kind of feminism there that is working. And yeah, they're like heroes. And amazing example it's it's like paris commune but much bigger scale uh much longer and so on thank you um i i don't know much about rojava but i know that um it, in lots of instances in the syrian revolution pre um you know mostly pre the kind of russian was well, actually still occurring under the Russian bombing. Um, there are lots of examples you can find of really practical mutual aid. Um, I think it's less, for some reason, for some reason I don't quite get the Western um, left and anarchist movement has had more access to Rojva. It's probably a language and cultural barrier, I imagine, but, um, but less so. But had less to do with and less to say about the um the revolution in the rest of Syria. But there were lots of examples of um mutual aid taking place amongst um uh, the Arab peoples there. I'll try and put a book on if I can find it quickly, I'll try and put a book in that's related into the chat. Um but it's um yeah that that was one of the things that when I started reading about it, even though it wasn't presented as anarchism, it was just people, you know, organising power for themselves and organising food for themselves. And what's that if it's not mutual aid, you know? Um, so, yeah. Um, but thanks, thanks for the response. Um, I'll try and... The Turkey who is attacking Rojava deliberately and it's European countries who is uh, making deals with Erdogan because uh, of varieties of uh, blackmailing uh, situations and powers that he's hold. And yeah, and of course, we in the West totally betrayed Kurds who, who defeated ISIS, first of all. It's basically a bunch of women <laughs> as well, girls who defeated ISIS. <laughs> And yeah. now we just allow uh, Erdogan slowly kind of tear them apart on our eyes without, mm -hmm. without helping them. Yeah. yeah. Had David been there? Had he, had he been out there? Yeah. yeah he, he, he went, okay. Wow. It, I, was, I was just going to say a quick story about David being out there. He wrote an article about it for um, New Internationalist, which is a magazine that I work for. Oh, okay. And there's this... And there's this brilliant bit in it, actually, where he's interviewing these two Rajavan um, women who are soldiers, <clears throat> as Nika's talking about. And they, they were so sincere in asking him to get this message out to the rest of the world, to all the women in the rest of the world, where they were saying, you must make sure this gets into the edit of, of this article. It's really important that all women read this. We're so sorry for you. We're so sorry that you're not living the way that we're living. And it was such an amazing, it was the, <clears throat> the sort of urgency and the sincerity of what they were saying, how important it was that women outside of Ajava heard about, you know, our heart goes out to you because it, it, you, you need to live like this. If you're women, you need to live like this. It was, it was an amazing moment. But yeah, he went out there quite a few times, Nika, I believe, but I, I remember him writing for New International just about it, yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well. That's amazing. Well, you muted yourself, James. Uh, no, I was just agreeing with you. Um, I was mouthing agreements behind the mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much, all, uh, for all your thoughts and especially for the book recommendations and uh, exactly launching the Anarchist Reading Club. Sounds really amazing. So if it will be the follow-up of this uh, salon, that would be great. And I'm sure that the uh, inter-intellect community will keep an eye on that. So 
Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Nika, for joining and inviting your friends. Uh, I think that uh, we, are, we all learned a lot today. And thanks again for that. And um, those of you who are interested, uh, we will continue this series uh, next year. Uh, since it's already December. And um, on the Inter Intellect website, you can find uh, all the topics of the upcoming salons. Uh, the dates are not finalized yet, but I guess that the next one will happen either mid-January or in the second half of January. So we will announce it on time. Thank you again for joining and have a nice day or have a nice evening, depending on where you are now. Thank you all and bye. Thank you. Lovely to meet everybody.